All right. Um, man, welcome out, guys. Good to see all of you guys. And uh, we are, for those of you who may not have been around last week, or, uh, or maybe this is your first Sunday visiting with us, we are in a year-long journey through the Bible in a series that we've entitled the Cover, cover to Cover, uh, where we are literally going cover to cover and we are preaching through every single book of the Bible. And if that sounds aggressive, it's only because it absolutely is. So uh, we've actually, as part of that, have a Bible reading plan. So I'm not going to ask this question or a show of hands, but how are you doing? How are you doing on that, right? Three chapters a day, ten minutes a day, read through the Bible through a year by tracking what I'm talking about. Yeah, a few people shaking heads. Uh, should be starting Exodus chapter one tomorrow, actually. We're like two weeks in, and we should already be finished with the book of Genesis, and we're going to kind of, it's going to track along with where we're at in our sermon series pretty close. We'll, we'll have some parts where we get ahead or behind, uh, but for the most part, we'll stay pretty close in our Bible reading plan. So how are you doing on that? And if the answer is, actually, I've fallen behind already, then like, fear not, you have a chance to start over tomorrow. Tomorrow is Exodus chapter 1, and so just start in and go back and highlight the passages that you missed. That's not a big deal, man. I promise you by the end of the year, you will have plenty of time. Don't let that be the thing. Uh, Who in here is like my perfectionist? Anybody that's like, dude, if I can't do it right and I can't do it like step by step the whole way, it's like I ain't even doing it, right? Like if I can't win, I'm not playing. Anybody anybody have one of those? Yeah, yeah. So that's me. Like if I can't win, I'm just not even going to play. And so when when I come to these moments and it's like, Holy smokes, I'm like three days behind in my Bible reading plan. Uh, well, better luck next year, right? It's like January the 10th or something like that. So uh, I just wanted to check in on you guys. Man, don't put that kind of pressure on yourselves. It is all right, right? Just start back up where we're at. And, and I promise you, like if it goes a little past December and you have to finish up, like uh, you'll be okay, right? It'll be, it'll be just fine. And somebody in here really needed to hear that, right? So uh, what I want to do this morning is I want to I do something that I'm not typically going to do, and that's to recap what we talked about last week. So if you're tracking, 66 books in the Bible, um, over the course of about 47 sermons, that means we are going to be booking it, right? There's going to be weeks where we do multiple books in one week, and we gave Genesis two weeks, and so like we're going to really have to get moving, and so every week is going to be kind of like a fresh start for us, right? Because there are their own self-contained units of information and stories and all that, and so going back and recapping what we talked about last week, we, we still have to do that, right? But today, I, I do, because we covered a few things that I think are, are critical and important to how we start the entire like rest of the year, how the rest of the year goes for us, right? And so uh, I want to recap some things, and I told you that the, the Bible is massive, man. Like like three thousand two hundred thirty seven different characters, four hundred plus different narrative strands that all sort of weave together to tell one unified story. Um, one thousand six hundred and sixty three different commands. Y'all, there's a lot, right? Like, there's poetry, there's narrative, there's wisdom literature, there's apocalyptic. Anybody read apocalyptic literature this week? That wasn't the Bible. No, because we don't even like have apocalyptic literature in our culture that, that isn't the Bible, unless it's like fiction, right? And so, uh, y'all, this is, this is an immense, like, thick, dense book, and, and it can be incredibly intimidating for people, right? And so, like I said, that like if we start getting off track and start chasing things that like we don't have time to chase, like y'all, we will end up in like, I don't know, we'll end up in the weeds, we'll end up in the ditch by the end of the year, right? And so we have to start things off right, and we have to do it a certain way or we're going to miss things. And I said every week I want us to do three things, three things, right? I said first, I want to give you the story overview. And that is like, what is the main story of this book trying to communicate? Through its various narratives, its characters, its commands, or its images. What's the story telling? And it tells it through different ways. It tells it through narratives, characters, commands, images, and and other ways. Like We we typically think of like plot moving forward, uh, but it doesn't necessarily, as we're going to see this morning, it it isn't always necessarily arranged that way, right? And so, man, what is the story actually trying to communicate? And last week, we went through Genesis 1 through 11. And, uh, and, I, and I showed you how Genesis 1 and 2 are both the same story. It's a creation account. And one is like spoken word poetry. And it's trying to involve your senses, your emotions, all of your intellect to produce change in you. And, and chapter 2, so that's chapter 1, chapter 2 is actually the more narrative telling. It's trying to convey information. And so like they, they're done for different purposes. And we looked at that last week. We looked at how chapter 3 begins mankind's long descent into like the fall, right? Um, the eventual judgment of mankind as they're kicked out of the garden. This is a lot of 
of stuff happening just in these first three chapters. Um, chapter 4 um, through 11, the rest of the story is just this downward spiral of mankind into worse and worse and worse failures. Man, it's, it's, it's like between human relationships. That's what chapter 4 is, right? It's a brother killing a brother over an act of worship, y'all. Like, like, please don't kill anybody in the parking lot when you leave today, right? Like, somebody was like, I don't know, they were singing too loud next to you, and so you just take a rock in the parking lot, and it, right? right? Like, like, we wouldn't do that, but like, from the very beginning, like, some very heinous and in, like terrible things have existed in us, and we've been capable of that because of the fall, right? And this is the story that Genesis one through eleven is trying to communicate, right? We talked about these different toll dots. Anybody remember? This is like extra credit. What a toll dot was from last week? Just shout it out. Genealogy, right? Hebrew word for generations, and it's the thing that we typically skip as we're reading through, right? So-and-so begat so-and-so, and they begat, and it's like, bro, what are we doing with this? And we're just like, all right, to the end of that, and on we go, right? And we skip it. I said, dude, don't skip those. Like, don't skip those. Those are there on purpose, right? And in the book of Genesis, we have ten Toledots. There's five in 1 through 11, so flood narrative and, and, and before, right? Table of Nations. And then five over the rest of the book. And, and those are like, those ten Toledots shoot forward through the text like arrows that different authors will pull from. And they just expect you to know the story. They expect you to know the story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so when they make this like, claim or they, they restate a, a, a genealogy later on in the book, man, they just expect you to know what's going on and the story's on, on either side of it. So don't skip those, right? And finally, we looked at the Tower of Babel and the Table of Nations narrative. Right? That, that's kind of how it worked out last week. And it's going to be completely different the way it works out this week. Right? But I uh, said so the second thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about some study concepts. If me giving you the story overview is like me giving you the fish, then the study concepts is like the me teaching you to fish moment, right? Uh, because I don't always want to have to be able to give you a fish. And you can't always like rely on somebody giving you a fish. You need to be able to fish for yourself. And that is to say, essentially, like, man, I, I want you to know how to read the Bible faithfully and truly for yourself in a way that it actually connects you to the real message and the real story that it's, that it's trying to get across. The thing that can change your life, and you don't need to be able to, you don't need to rely on some guy on a stage like me to do that for you. Because one, you may go to a place where they don't like, they aren't very careful about pulling the truth out of the text, right? And, and I do the best job that I can, but, but even I get it wrong sometimes. And I, I say things or do things that I have to come back and correct or apologize for later, right? And so like, like man, it's just you being able to do that is a big deal. And so I said every week, I want to give you the reading, study, and interpretation tools needed to read the Bible for yourself in a way that may, remains faithful to the text and connects you to the truth that can change your life. I made a big, bold statement last week. I told you that I could give you a single sentence that would radically change the way that you read your Bible. Like, in the way that your Bible affects your life, in the way you understand your Bible. Like, some of you have struggled reading the Bible, and so you don't. And so, but, I, but I told you that I can give you a single, and I don't make big, bold claims like this very often, but I can give you a single sentence that if you will take it seriously, and you will carry it in the front of your mind as you open up your Bible, and let it inform the questions that you ask, the things that you're seeking out through the stories and the narratives and characters, that, man, it will radically revolutionize the way that you approach your Bible. And here's that sentence. This is what I said. I said, the Bible can not mean something for us today that it did not mean to the original intended audience. Y'all, lock that away. This isn't your story. You're not even a main character in the story. In fact, it, it wasn't even originally communicated to you. The, the truth is, is that God spoke through human authors in a specific time and place to a specific group of people in specific circumstances. And when we see the truth that the author was trying to convey to them, all of a sudden now we're connected to the deeper, timeless truth that God actually intended for all of us. But it's only as we go back and see the story the way that they saw the story that we begin to see that truth. You guys tracking on that, right? I know I'm doing a recap here, so I'm, I'm, I may be leaving some stuff out. I'll give you a good example. Uh, Genesis 1 and 2, right? What, what are Genesis 1 and 2? You guys who know your Bible. Creation account, right? Creation of the world and all that. And so what, what inevitably happens is we think about that as like, like material origins of the universe. Anybody? It's where everything came from and all that. And I told you guys, what if, what if that actually wasn't at the end of the day the main thing that they were trying to communicate through that? 
Like we go in and we have ideas about matter and where stuff comes from and energy and light and animals and all that and how, how this, all the systems work. We have sort of what we call like a 21st century cosmology. And what we'll do is we'll go into the text and we'll ask the Bible to answer questions that sort of satisfy our 21st century minds. And here's the deal. You're always going to be disappointed. You will always be disappointed if you go into the text asking it to do that because guess what? It's not a science book. It's also not a history book either. It will radically change the way you see history, but it's not a history book. That's not what it's trying to do at the end of the day, right? So if we see it the way they saw it, then what we see is a loving creator, man, who took his time with his creation, creating us specifically on purpose, right, as his image bearers. And that is radically different than the way every other culture has ever seen God. And it tells us some things about who God is and who we are in relationship. That's what Genesis 1 and 2 is trying to communicate in fact, that's what the entire Bible is trying to communicate, is who God is and who we are in relationship to that, right? I said, if this story, this is the third thing we're going to do every week, because I said, if this story is actually going to change our lives, then there is only one thing that can do that. And it isn't you knowing more information. It isn't you memorizing more commands and trying harder and doing better because you will never do it, right? In fact, all those commands are there not so you keep them, but to show you what an abysmal failure you are at keeping those commands. That's why those commands exist in the Bible. No, man, it isn't, it isn't there as a list of things for you to keep. Actually, the only thing that is powerful enough to change you, Romans chapter 1 says, man, it's the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation, right? And I said, man, that every week we're going to take steps to look at the pictures of Christ in the gospel in all of these stories. I said that is the portions of the gospel and the images of Christ that are foreshadowed or played out in the events in the other stories of the Bible. I, I gave you guys this example when we went through the Joseph uh, narrative a few months back. I said, man, you go, to, you go to Mount Rainier, right? You take a picture in front of Rainier. Rainier is gorgeous, man. It's just picturesque. Nothing compares like to the natural beauty of that mountain when it's like out and full right but but what do we do because we can't focus on two things in our camera at once right so what we have to do is we have to choose one or the other we focus on the person or the thing in the foreground right you get a little marmot in the foreground or something and you want to like focus on that or and blur out the mountain or do you want to focus on the mountain and sort of blur out the, the foreground image Dude, this is what the Bible is doing, man, is that there is a story below the story. There's a story beneath the story that is happening that's actually in every passage, in every chapter, is pointing our eyes forward to who Jesus is in the gospel that can save and transform us. I said if we, if we miss out and we focus on the marmot and we blur out the background, then, man, we cut ourselves off from the power that the Bible actually has for us. At the end of the day, man, like, like this is about who Jesus is. If the Bible is about God revealing Himself to us and Jesus is the utmost expression of that, that's what the Bible is about. And y'all, that is the thing that when we find ourselves in relationship to Him and in relationship to that Gospel, that's the thing that has the power to change everything. Change your marriage, change your finances, change the way you see your work, change every aspect of who you are. Alright, you guys good? You guys tracking? Alright, story overview. Everybody, or, or, uh, that was our recap from last week. Everybody, everybody feel like you were here? Cool. Um, it was, took long enough, so you basically were. Uh, all right, story overview. We're going to begin there. Genesis 12 through 50. So if, if you're doing some math, we've got like 38 verses to go today, right? So uh, 12 through 50. Uh, you've read, you're, some of you guys have read that. Um, what are some stories that come out of Genesis 12 through 50? Some big, a lot of big stories. Right, just name a few off. This is where you can speak in church. Joseph, yep, Joseph narrative. We, we just looked at that a few months ago. It's awesome. What else? Abraham, Abraham, yep, yeah. Isaac, what, what, what else? Any other big, like, specific story? What's something else that comes out of that? Yeah, Jacob and Rachel and Leah, and, and dude, that's a mess, <laughs> right? Uh, well, what else? Anything else? You got any other ones, right? Lot, yeah, that's another one, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you guys named off, like, half a dozen, and there's, there's about two dozen more other, like, little narratives and storylines and stuff like that. So, just put yourself in my shoes for a second. Like, I have to cover the entire Bible, like the entire rest of this book. What do you pick? What do you pick? How do you tell the story in a way that, like, communicates what the story is actually about? Because, like, there's, like, two dozen or more different stories, and they're all different. And they're all communicating. So, like, how do you tell the story in a way that, like, gets its message across? One, you don't waste time asking questions like that. But here is the second way, right? This is how we typically think. If you have, 
like a, uh, if you have a study Bible, then, then, then while you're here, just like flip to the front of that, and you're going to see a, a breakdown of the entire book of Genesis, right? And how is it broken down? It's probably, you know, Genesis 1 through 3 is the creation and fall narrative, and it, it'll, it'll sort of have it outlined for you. I promise you, if you have a, a, like a good study Bible, it's, it's got that in there. It's Abraham and Sarah, it's Lot, it's Isaac, it's Jacob and Esau, it's Jacob and Haran, it's, jo- you know, it's uh, Jacob's sons, and, and you know, Joseph. In, in some format of that, it's going to be arranged with, with chapters and, and verses. You guys track in, track in what I'm saying. And that's typically how we think of the story. It's because we're, we're, we're Westerners, and we like things that are concrete, sequential in, in their presentation. We like it when A turns to B and B turns to C and C and then you know, what comes next after C is D. And we can, we can sort of expect that. And so as we arrange the Bible in our thought press process, we think about, well, chronologically, it's, it's Abraham. It's, and then it's, you know, it's Isaac and it's Jacob and it's his sons. And it's this event leads to this event, which progresses to this event. And for the most part, that works pretty well, um, except for the fact that that's actually not how the the author of the book arranged it. That's not how they thought about it. That's not how they arranged the book. And, and when we do, when we miss that, like how he actually arranged it, do we miss some things? Like you come to the story, jo- the Joseph narrative kicks off in like Genesis 36, 37, something like that. And then like a chapter or two into the Joseph narrative, it just like has this hard break and it tells this really weird, out of context story about Judah and Tamar. If you know the story I'm talking about, it's like terrible, right? It's like, dude, what in the world is going on? Why, like, I thought this was Joseph's story, and it was moving along fine. He gets, you know, his brothers, it's the dream, he's sold into slavery. And then it just breaks in the middle of the story. And you, like, you're, you're left like, well, that was weird, you know? And you read through it, and then well, back to the Joseph narrative. We go, right? And it kind of progresses on, and it fits back into our mold of, of concrete sequential. And here's the deal, man. When you understand the way that Genesis is like put together, and it's not concrete sequential. It's not A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Actually, when you you see this, we don't have to cover all of the stories because we're going to cover all the stories as we cover about three things this morning, right? So uh, it's typically, I I think I put a picture up here. This is how we think about it. Tell me I put pictures up there this week. Oh, thank goodness, man. So I, I, like, I like made these pictures, and then last week they did not make their way into the slideshow, and I was so upset because I spent like so long on that. But anyways, all right, so this is how Genesis is arranged. Genesis 1 through 11, it's the fall, right? And then 12 through 50, uh, maybe your Bible has that as like Abraham or the patriarchs or, you know, the story of redemption begins or something like that, right? Um, instead, actually, um, uh, here is, here is, uh, here's a way that we're going to think about it. I think there's another picture comes up next, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, these, these are two chunks, and in between these two chunks, they are linked together by a passage that we're going to look at today. Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. And here's it. I told you guys last week that Genesis is like the key to a map. You know what a key to a map is, right? Like here's what a river looks like. Here's what a road is. Right? This is how far a mile is. And, and like without that key, you, like you'll never read the map the right way, right? Because that far may be like a mile if you're zoomed into Yom. But if you're zoomed out across the United States, that may be like 700 miles, right? And like it actually really, really matters. This way is north. This is what a road is. This is what an interstate is. Whatever the case is, the key to the map helps you understand and not get lost in your journey. Well, Genesis is like the key to the map to the whole Bible. And if that's the case, then like Genesis 12, 1 through 3, the thing that we're going to look at is like the key to the key to the map. I don't guess that's really a thing, but like it's the key to understanding Genesis, right? And by extension, the entire Bible, right? And so, Genesis 11, it ends with one of those Toledot genealogies, and something weird happens that sort of keys our mind that the story is about to shift a little bit. We read this in Genesis 11.30. We we meet this guy named, uh, we meet this guy named Terah, and he has these sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and then we meet their wives. And so you're, like, you're thinking it's kind of a normal genealogy, right? And then it zooms in and tells a little snippet of information about one of their wives. And it says, Sariah, this was Abram's wife, was barren. She had no child. And if you're tracking things up to this point, that's really different from all of the other genealogies because they don't stop to give you details like that. It's just a, it's a list of names. Maybe they moved somewhere or something like that, but nothing like personal about it like this is, right? And then chapter 11 finishes with the genealogy the way that they all, all, all do. And then chapter 12 begins, and, and we see something that, that is, is radically different, right? And so uh, this, this, is, uh, 
this is what we see, right? Um, God has been, uh, I think maybe the best way to do it is just to read it. So Genesis 12, 1 3, if you have your Bibles with me, we'll, we'll, I'll show you what I mean. Now the Lord said to Abram, stop, stop right there. Um, because if you're paying attention up to this story, you're meant to sort of read that and be like, oh, like what's, what's coming next, right? Because the last time God spoke, he told the dude to build a boat, right? Because he's coming to wipe everything out. The time he spoke before that was to arbitrate a murder trial. And the time that he spoke to people before that was to kick mankind out of the garden. And so you open up Genesis 12, chapter 12, and it's like, dude, we, we, had, we had messed up again at the end of Genesis chapter 11. And then you see that now the Lord spoke to somebody, and you're like, oh, like what's coming now, right? But, but it's different this time. He says, go forth from your country and from your relatives, this is talking to Abram, right? And from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And here's the deal. Like, that's radical. And you didn't do that. We need to talk about culture for just a second. Um, I, was, uh, I was talking to uh, a foreign exchange student from China. This was a couple of years ago. And I asked him, I said, hey man, what do you, uh, what do you want to go to college for? And he said, uh, I'm going for uh, accounting. And I was like, oh, well, I hate accounting. That sounds terrible. But you like it. And he's like, well, actually, no, I don't like it either. And I'm like, well, bro, why are you doing it then? Like, why are you, why are you going for accounting? He said, oh, because my mom and dad said for me to go for accounting. And I'm like, dude, for me, that's radical. Like, no, no way. I'm not doing accounting. Like, if mom and dad told me I'm doing accounting, I'm going like, to be, be poor and broke because I'm not the guy you want touching your numbers. Ain't that right, Karen? Like, I'm not the guy that you want, you want touching numbers, right? So, so but, but for him, he was like, no, I, I just do this. And, and I got to think about it. I'm like, oh, wait a second, man. For him and for his culture, that's just like sort of how things work. Like the family unit and the needs of the family are, are like superior to the needs of the individual, right? And, and so what you would have in, in Abram's culture is like dad was a goat herder and dad's dad was a goat herder and his dad was a goat herder and his dad was a goat herder all the way back. And so Abraham, guess what he was going to be? Goat herder. Yeah, you're right. And so for him to be like, actually, dad, goats smell bad and I hate their milk. It's, it's gross, you know, and I want to play the flute and dance, right? And so I'm going to leave. And I'm going to play the flute and dance and you can keep the goats. Like, guess what? It would have never been in his framework to have done that. From the time he was born up, like he would have been there in his father's house. Like he would have been, like he would have sort of added on to that. And like, like maybe they would have spread out just to give the animals room a little bit, but, but they would have all existed in the same sort of community and family. And God is asking something radical of him, right? And we, we kind of miss that detail, right? So I want you to leave and I want you to go to this country that I'm going to show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. If you want to understand the message and the overview of Genesis, you need to understand like these three verses because we just saw it. There are three things. Um, let's look at our next picture, man. Um, this is it. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Can you, can you guys read that? All right. Covenant, seed, and land. The entire book of Genesis isn't arranged from story to story to story. The entire book of Genesis is arranged around these three ideas. Covenant, seed, and land. Right? And when you, like, when you see the story in those terms, all of a sudden now, like... Dude, it goes from like black and white on a little tube television to like 4K ultra high def like color TV, right? Like the story jumps alive in a way that like, like, like I promise you, you've never viewed. If you view it through the lens of those three things, I'm, I'm going to kind of help you do that here in just a second. It, it, the story jumps alive. And, and what we'll see is this covenant, it's Genesis 12, 1 through 3. We'll see it repeated several times over the course of the book and stuff will get added onto it and there will be stuff that sort of it gets tacked on to the sides, but it will never be less than it is right here, right? It will never be less than covenant, seed, in land. So let's talk about covenant for just a second. Covenant is a promised agreement made to be unbreakable. Uh, we don't have anything like it really in our culture today. Um, a contract really doesn't do it justice because there are terms of escape for both parties in a contract, right? Like, should you die or should, you know, you just reject the terms of our contract and start doing your own thing? Whatever the case, there's, there's an out for you in that. 
It's supposed to be marriage, but we've kind of like messed that one up too a little bit in our culture. Marriage is supposed to be sort of the idea is that, f- that, that husband and wife leave their fathers and mothers and they come together to be what? What's the, what's the term? One flesh, right? One, one flesh. And so here's the idea. Like, um, maybe if you're a big, strong dude, could you like grab my arms and like tear me in half? Yeah, sure. Uh, but I wouldn't be a human being anymore and I wouldn't be alive. I wouldn't even actually be recognizable. And this is sort of the idea is that, man, like to undo a covenant like destroys the very people that are involved. And actually, we see this because a little bit later on in the story, God like God reiterates the covenant and he comes in to give Moses a sign or to give Abraham a sign of the covenant. Here's what he says. Genesis 15, 7 through 10. He says, he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of the land of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, oh Lord, how may I know that I will possess? How, how do I know that I can trust you in this? This is essentially, I mean, I left my father's house, man. I did something that you just don't do. How do I know that you're going to be faithful to this? And so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all those things to him and he, uh, he cuts them in half. And then he lays each half opposite the other and he didn't cut the birds. Don't know why that's in there, but he didn't, he didn't cut those, right? And, uh, and so here's the deal. If, if you're tracking land, seed, and covenant, see if you can pick that out of this next part that I'm about to read, 17 through 18. So it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. This is, this is symbolic of the presence of God that has come. He's, he has like knocked Abraham out, and he's like laying out cold, kind of like dreaming this in the corner. And God shows up in this sort of flaming fire pot, and he passes between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, right? What a weird thing to do. Like, why would, like, imagine, like, I bought a camper uh, a few months ago, right? And uh, so we signed all the papers, and then we went outside, and they took a picture of me of my sign, like, looking goofy in front of my camper. And I guess they posted on their Facebook or something. But, like, what if we were about to, like, sign the paper, and he was, oh, wait, 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 just a second, we got to go out back. And, like, like, Dave has made preparations. And we're like, who's Dave, and what preparations? And you go out there, and there's, like, a bunch of livestock cut in half, and you're like, bro, what is that? And he's like, well, we need to walk between these two things to seal our deal, you know? And you're like, no, we don't. We're not doing that, obviously, right? Like, like so what a weird thing for us. But for them, that was normal. And the idea was, like, may we be like these animals if we break this covenant. May we be, like, may we be torn in half. It will, it will undo us. It will be our undoing if this saying is broken. Like It was made to be unbreakable, right? And here's the deal, man. Is he knocks Abraham out and he walks through him by himself. That is, to say, that is to say that God knew we wouldn't be faithful to the terms of his covenant. And so he is upholding it based on nothing more than his own faithfulness. And that covenant has two parts, land and seed. So let's start with seed. Um, I mean that in the most, I don't know, way that I can mean. By seed, the author of Genesis is meaning descendants. That's what he's meaning. Right? Here, here it is, Genesis 12, 2. And I'll make you a what? A great nation. And I'll bless you and make your name great. Right? Abraham was just one man, and he and his wife were, were like well beyond childbearing years in the story. Um, chapter 11 tells us the reason why. It gives us that detail, Right? Um, Sarah was incapable, and here's the deal. Uh, two people don't make a nation, do they? Two people don't make a nation. That's, that's like easy math. Um, and so there, there's going to have to be something more come from their family line if there's, if there's going to be a nation of people one day. And then second, to make your name great. Um, actually, this is a really big clue. It's tied to the idea of glory, and glory actually has its tie to like having children. I don't know if you knew that or not, but to be like glorified is to have a bunch of kids. Um, so I don't know that that's what it would mean for me, but uh, that's for some people. Yeah. Uh, so they, um, in, in their day, the greatness of your name was tied to the number of children you had and the size of the family that you had, right? Remember in their culture, a big family was everything. And so even though Abraham had done well for himself materially, I got to think he felt like a little bit of a failure because dude, he didn't, he didn't have any Kids, you didn't have any family, right? And, and, and here's the deal. The inability to have children is an incredibly touchy subject, even in our culture today. So imagine, imagine what it would have been like for him and the culture they lived in. And get this, man. God knew this. God knew Abram. God knew his heart. God knew the culture in which Abraham lived in, in the expectation and the thoughts and the feelings about him, right? And so here's the deal. Is it just kids for kids' sakes? No. 
It's not. It's like, like, like he's not just blessing Abraham just to have a bunch of kids so his name can be great. Why did he bless him? Well, if you look back in the story, it's because like through him and through this lineage, this, this family, this nation, this, this little seed of promise, like he's going to bless all the nations of the earth. Somehow, through the seed of promise, God is going to bless all the people of the earth. And so what is blessing? Is it just richness? Is it like just material blessing? Is that, is that what it means? Remember I told you guys that, that this acts as a link between 1 and 11 and 12 through 50, right? So let's think backwards for just a second. What is the opposite of a blessing? A curse. Yeah. And what did we watch unfold over 11 chapters? Dude, it, the, the ground is cursed. Like y'all, we, like the creation itself is coming undone. It's being unmade, and it set itself against us. Like you're gonna, you're gonna scratch bread out of the surface of the dust of the earth by the sweat of your brow until you return to the dirt one day. What's chapter four? Y'all, the curse. It's human relationships. They break down and they are messed up. And it isn't just in a family or an individual scale. Six through eleven, man, this thing is global. We have broken everything. And somehow, through this seed of promise, man, He's coming to undo the curse. And you felt it. You felt it. This week, man, it's your job, and your relationships, and the people that like, you're supposed to be able to like, depend on or whatever. Broken creation. Maybe it's not even people. Maybe it's just creation that breaks down. Maybe it's your body and you felt it this week. And man, like, here's the deal. The seed of promise is coming to bless the whole earth. And it isn't material riches. And his blessing is unmaking the curse that, that we've seen in Genesis 1 through 11, right? And so, like, here's the deal when we read the Genesis story in light of this, dude, it lights up. What's, what's Abraham's story about? It's about seed, isn't it? It's about having a kid. What about Isaac's story? How does his story kick off? It's just two, two boys, it's twin boys that are born, and like one's big, red headed, hairy dude, and the other one's like the smooth skinned mama's boy, right? And they're like at war with one another from the very beginning. Like, how is this going to turn out? What, what, about, what about Jacob's story? Y'all, his, that's all his story is about, right? Yeah, women like trading spices out of their garden just for a chance to have his babies, right? And then, and then he has all these kids, he has all these like 12 boys, and you think maybe this is it. Maybe this is the nation that we've seen, right? That we've been looking for. Maybe one of these guys are like the seed of promise, and the, the only problem is they're all duds. Every one of them are, except for one, right? Joseph. We meet Joseph. And y'all, he's like the picture of the seed of promise. Like, what, what's Joseph's story? What's the height of Joseph's story, right? God, it's the unmaking of the curse. The ground had set its face against all mankind, right? A famine such as the world had never seen before. And what's Joseph doing? They're not scratching, they're not scratching the existence out of the ground. Like Joseph's given bread freely, man. He has an abundance of it. Dude, he's a picture. He's a picture of the seed of promise. He's not the seed of promise, but he's a picture of it. And then, like, all of a sudden, I think this is my notes. I don't, I don't want to, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, if you see the story in terms of seed, then you come to that weird story in, in Genesis 38. Remember I told you, Judah and Tamar, and it is all about seed, right? Um, so you come to that weird story, and you're like, like, what in the world is that about, right? And why is that going? But because you're tracking this concept of seed, you come to the end of the story, the end of the Joseph narrative, and Jacob is lying on his deathbed, and he is like passing down like, like this blessing, this generational blessing to his sons, and this is what it's going to mean. And guess what, man? Like Judah. Judah is the one that this seed of promise is going to come through. Holy smokes, it's not a Joseph story. It's been Judah's story all along. Like, dude, Plot twist at the end of this thing. It isn't about Joseph at all, man. It's actually about what God intended to do to preserve the seed of blessing through Judah, who was a dud himself. Dude, that's what the story's about. So that's seed. Let's talk about land. Just 12, here's where we see land, right? Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from the relatives and from your father's house. What? To the land which I will show you. And this is the deal. This develops and grows over the course of the text. Um, it develops into the promised land later on, right? Uh, we see the promised land. We see it's this uh, described as this land flowing with milk and honey. It's milk and honey, man. It's 
goats and bees and flowers and trees and abundance, right? So that's what, that's what a land flowing milk and honey is. It, it represents abundance, a land that just like gives of itself. It's later described as a land with houses that they didn't build. They're going to drink from wells they didn't dig, and they're going to enjoy wine from vineyards that they didn't cultivate. Now, what's this sound like? Remember, this is a link between 1 through 11 and 12 through 15. Like, what's that sound like from the story we've read? That's Eden, man. That's Eden. That's, that's the description of this land. And the best part about this land, that just like Eden, this is the story, this is like where God dwells with his people at. And so when you start to see the story in those terms, like all of a sudden now you see these movements in and out of the land. You see that actually by the end of, of Genesis, they don't come to own or possess more than like a field in the land. And they're actually off in Egypt and dude, they're, they're in a place as far away from the land as they've ever been before, right? And so as you sort of keep that idea of, of land in your mind and you read the text and you see it develop and you see what it means, you see these, these like sort of punctuated moments. Where Abraham is like told by God to go to this specific mountain. Then he names that like the mountain of the Lord. It's the mountain of God. And you have, you have Jacob running from his brother and, and from his family. And he comes to this place. And he has this like vision and he sees God. And this is like, dude, this is where God is. This is the, this is the house of God. This is Beth El, man. This is, how, this is God's house. And so all these like punctuated stories and moments, and like it's arranged around those things land and seed and covenant that's how the story's broken down right and and now it's probably a good idea to talk about study concepts we got plenty of time we're doing good y'all so uh study concepts i don't want to give you a new concept this week because we talked about the idea last week right that the bible cannot mean something for us today that it did not mean for the original audience we need to do a little bit more work around that one before we move on to sort of our next um study concept um I want to kind of give you an example and explain how that process works. I just sort of delivered the process already prepackaged to you last week. We're, we're going to work through that process together. So this morning, um, we believe with great certainty that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? Um, minus like a few editorial notes. Um, there's some stuff recorded after Moses died, which, you know, obviously he wasn't writing from beyond the grave, and so somebody had to have come back in and, and fill in a few details and write a few things and, and may have kind of edited things a little bit, right? And that's not a bad thing. We absolutely believe the Bible was completely inspired by God, right? And, uh, and then we believe, like, we actually know when Moses wrote it. And this is incredibly critical. If you want to know how, like, we know this, like, hit me up later. I would love to have that conversation and nerd out with you for, you know, an hour or something. And we could talk about that, right? But, but just, like, for now, take my word on this. We, we believe we know when Moses wrote the book. We believe that he started writing the book of Genesis as soon as Moses came back to Egypt, Right, so Moses, leader of the Exodus generation and all that stuff, right? So, so he's in Egypt first 40 years, he goes and he lives in the wilderness 40 years, and then God calls him back to rescue his people from, from, from Egypt, right? So uh, we believe that like, he was facing off with Pharaoh by day and like feverishly pinning the book of Genesis by night. And we actually believe that Moses finished the book before they ever even made it to Mount Sinai. Um, so, which is like a span of, of just a few months, right? Not, not very long. And, uh, and so here's what that tells us. That's actually a really big deal. Um, because, we, we, uh, because of that, we think we know who he was writing to. So we know who he was writing to. And when you begin to read the story with that lens on, dude, it takes on like more meaning and makes a lot more sense. right? We believe that Moses wrote the book of Genesis for the Exodus generation. For that first generation that came out of Egypt and went on to possess or to try and possess the promised land. So, so here's the deal. Like, like, to understand it, you, you have to put yourself in their shoes, right? So let's, let's do that for just a second. You have lived in Egypt your entire life. Um, your dad was born and raised there. Your granddad was born and raised there. Your great-granddad, like, dude, um, you, your, your whole family. 
You've had friends, maybe even a spouse, or maybe even some of your kids that have died at the hands of the Egyptians, or harsh labor, whatever the case is, man, it, it's, it's getting bad, and with every new pharaoh or every new governor, you just kind of like cringe up because, man, you don't know what it's going to mean for you and for your people. It could get really, really bad. At, they could just come in and kill us all if they wanted to. There's not a thing that we could do about it. So you live in this constant fear and constant, like, man, you, you have no control over your life, and then... Like, you've been there forever, like 437 years by the time Moses showed back. Y'all, y'all, like, you tracking? That's like 1585, right? That's, that's 437 years ago, right? I think that's right. That's, that's, a, that's a hot minute. Longer than the United States has been, like, much longer than the United States has been a, been a nation, right? This is a long, long time. Then one day... You hear these whispers that there's this guy that's like rolled into town and he's talking about a slave revolt. And you're like, bro, this is not a good idea. You got some of your friends and family that are like, dude, let's go, let's stick it to the Egyptians. And you have the, the others that are like, no, man, we just need to keep our heads down, right? And you, so you have all these people talking, you, you don't really know what's going on. And then you start to see some things. You step outside one day and it just stinks outside, like bad, like stinks bad. You hear about all these frogs or something and, and it's just right over the next hill, but this your job, you don't work over there, so you don't like travel over there and, Maybe you, maybe you can see the Nile River, and it's like blood red one day. There's a dark, nasty cloud that's hanging over the land. Of it. Like You have no what is happening. And then one day, your, your neighbor comes to you, your buddy comes to you, he's like, bro, get, get a lamb, get, get a one-year-old lamb, you're going to kill it, and you're going to paint its blood over your doorframe. You're like, what? Why would I do that? That's insane. No, no, but, but, but do this, because like, some, like something's happening tonight, and like, dude, the firstborn in every house is going to die. You have to do this, and then you have to eat this meal, but you, you got to eat it like with your robes on, you got to eat it with your staff in your hand, you're, like ready to go. We're going somewhere, like it's happening tonight, right? And man, you've seen enough to know that like, I better do it because like, yeah, there's some unexplainable things that have been happening. Like, and so you do. You're there and you're enjoying this meal and you hear the blood curdling screams come from across the street and it's your neighbor, man. You run out in the street and dude, there's this activity and they're like, people are just like looting the Egyptians, right? And, and, and all you know is people just start walking. All your neighbors, all your family, all the people that you know, you start, a couple hours later, you're like outside of the city. What is happening? You wouldn't have been privy to the story. You wouldn't have had all the back. Like, we see from this like 30,000 foot view of what the Exodus story looked like. They didn't have that. They just like experienced it, y'all. And they didn't have social media or people like posting pictures on Twitter or Instagram about what was happening, right? They just had to kind of like find out from the grapevine. And you're traveling along, man, and you hear that you're like headed somewhere. Somewhere, right? And I want you to think about this. You are the leader of your family, and you've just left, and to go back would mean certain death for you and your family. And yet, you're just walking into one of the most inhospitable places in the world, which would also mean death for you and your family, right? And so, like, bro, I need some answers. And then one day, like, you're walking along, like, there's been some other crazy stuff happening on the journey, and, and one of the family elders hands you the scroll because you work in the foreman's office, and you can read. It's tonight we're reading this. And you sit down, and you open it up, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the one that with a word can turn darkness into light. Turn the chaos and death of water into, into the ability to provide life. He's the one that tells the fish and the birds and the frogs and the flies and the gnats what to do. Like he, He's the one who creates it all, man, and actually he has a really high view of humanity. He loves us. And, and then you read on and you hear the story, story after story after story, how God keeps His promises. He, this is the God who can be trusted that when He says something, He follows through. And then you meet this like seed of promise that comes to rescue His people from the curse. And you, you look up and you see Moses. Dude, and he's the one that wields like the power of God to like unmake creation in these ten plagues. And like, dude, is He it? Is He the, is he the one? And then you read, about, you read about the land, the people, the nation, right? And you look up, man, and in an instant, you were that people. You were the nation that just like overnight you were here. Where are we headed? We're headed to the promised land. And God's promises are good. And He's doing something. He's leading us back into this Eden place. Like, like dude, here's the deal. Moses wrote the book of Genesis for the Exodus generation, yes, but he, but he did it. He did it. He wrote the book of Genesis to give the Exodus generation the framework to possess the promised land. 
This is who you are. This is who God is, man. This is what, this is what covenant means. This is, what, this is how you trust God. And so they get out there in the, in the wilderness, right? There's no water, man. We're all going to die. <laughs> no, you're not. Like, do, do you trust God? Do you trust Him in this? It's the God who comes through. And it's probably, that's what you've read up to this point as you've read the book of Genesis. We trust me. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yep. We trust you. Or, or they didn't at times, right? There's no food. We trust me? Okay, in fact, actually, I'm going to feed you every day, but every meal, I'm going to need you to trust me. I need you to trust me not to gather too much. I need you to trust me not to gather too little and to gather when I say to gather, right? Do, do you trust me? I know the people of the land, are, they look like giants, and you're an untrained group of like former slaves, but like, do you trust me to fight for you? And you go back and you read Abraham's story, and it's like you see Abraham like not trust God as he tries to take matters into his own hands and have a have a child apart from the way that God had promised it to happen. And what happens? It blows up in his face. Do, do you trust God? And will you allow him to be the one that like sees his promises through? Because, dude, God God knocked Abraham out when he walked through the covenant because he knew that we would inevitably fail the terms of that. It's God in His faithfulness. And so here's the deal. We aren't the Exodus generation, are we? It's not who we are. Um, we live in Washington, <laughs> the United States. Uh, a few thousand years later, we're not, we're not like a, a band of rebel slaves off to go possess the promised land. That's not us, right? It's not who we are. We're like, what does this story have to do, have to do with us? Right? We're not Abraham. Not Isaac, you know, like maybe some of us are praying for children. I don't, I don't know, you know, but like, but like what are the, what are, what's the transference between these stories in Genesis in our life? And this is the part where we have to stop and we have to talk about a few pictures of Christ in the gospel. So as much as I love the Joseph narrative, um, we talked through that uh, about two, three months ago, I think. So, man, if you, if you want a more in-depth, go, go watch that sermon series, man, because we talked all about that, focusing on the background image, right? Uh, so we're not going to talk about that. I gave you about a half a dozen last week. I just want to give you one this morning, and it is hands down, I think, my favorite picture of Christ in the gospel in the entire Old, Old Testament. So if you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 22. Let me set the scene for you. Abraham is old. Like, like he was already old when the story started, but he is like old, old now. Isaac, we believe, is maybe in his early 20s at this point of the story. Uh, he wasn't like, I don't know, I've seen the flannel graphs, and he's like a little lad, but actually we think he was a little bit older. Older than that, right? Um, and, dude, he could coast. He'd made it. Dude, materially, he was set. He had his heir. He was set. Like, he had his family. Like, like the promises of God have, like, unfolded before him. He's good to go. And he could just coast out the rest of his life and be just fine. And then we read, God speaks again. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, He's, or he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. I want you to go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain of which I will tell you. Tell you. What? <laughs> what? Like, g g come again? Like, dude, th this is, Abraham had it made in the shade, y'all. He could not die knowing that God like, was faithful to His covenant promise. And then he's asked to do this. Dude, there are so many things wrong with this, with what was just asked. Like, namely, the fact that like, God doesn't do this. He doesn't ask for human sacrifices. In fact, He, he like, vehemently condemns them. And Abraham knew this, and yet God is like, like, this doesn't make any sense, and we don't, we don't see any of those questions. Look, look what he does. Like, here he goes. And so, Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, and split the wood, and rose and went to the place that God had told him. Verse 5, and he said to his young men, right, they get there, they, they see, see the place off the distance, verse 4, and then verse 5, he said to the young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we'll worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, and he Gave it to his son. He took in his hand the fire and the knife. He's got his torch and his, uh, his knife. The two of them, they walked on together. <laughs> Here's the deal, man. Isaac is walking along. He's holding the wood and he's looking at his dad and he's like kind of looking at the guys as they walk off. And like he's old enough to know that there's something missing from this equation, isn't there? 
should be some sort of animal like you know, on a leash traveling with us if, if we're going to go make a sacrifice. And so being the astute young man that he was, he asked this question. He says, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. He said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold the fire and the wood, uh, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Get this, y'all, man. Abraham trusted God. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Y'all, here, here's the deal. You, you, m- most of you guys, if you're sitting here this morning, you, you probably know how the rest of this story ends. But, but I want you to stop for just a second, and let's pretend that you don't. Right? Let's pretend that you don't know how this story is. So just wipe the ending of this story out of your mind. And let's reread that, that sentence. Right? God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Right? So here's the deal. Because even if the offering truly was to be Isaac, who had provided him? God did. You know, Abraham had learned to remove himself from the equation. He now knows why God knocked him out and passed through those animals to seal the covenant for himself. Right? He knows. Dude, he's he's got a whole other family that like blew up in his face because he tried to take matters into his own hands. He watched how Lot's story literally flamed out at the end, y'all. Blew up. Wasn't Eliezer, man. It was nothing. There was nothing he could do. Abraham's learned, man, God... Abraham was just a recipient of God's blessing. He did nothing to earn it. His only served to mess things up any time he's involved himself in the process. And in the greatest climactic buildup in the story so far, man, they came to the place which God had told him. Abraham builds the altar. He ranges the wood. And he bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar and on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand he took the knife to slay his son, man, and he takes a, takes a deep breath and he closes his eyes and I'm sure tears are streaming down his face as he raises up the knife, man. And just as he's about to, it's Abraham. Abraham! He says, here I am. Right? He says, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son for me. Y'all, you see the picture. You see the picture of the gospel in this. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Did you see it? Did you see the picture of Jesus in that? It's a picture of the gospel that just like unfolded right there, right? And, and here's the deal. In case you missed like maybe the significance of that, let me, let me give you a couple of little details. We actually know where Mount Moriah is. Um, later on in the story, Solomon builds a temple on top of it. Actually, scholars believe that it wasn't that, that hilltop because there are multiple hilltops to Mount Moriah, one of which being the place where Jesus would lay down his own life. And this unfolds right there. At that place. And another thing, man, is like, like actually we know a little bit about the geography and plant life of that region. There's only one, there's only one type of bush or one type of thicket capable of catching an animal by its horns in that, in that region. It's the thorn tree. Should we see it um, a few books later, we're going to see somebody get caught in a thorn tree, man. There's, there's only one thing that, that would catch somebody in that. Did you, did you notice the pictures of the gospel? We see Jesus as the sacrificial lamb with the crown of thorns. We see Jesus as the son of promise whom God did not withhold from us. This is the picture that it's pointing to. That Jesus came as the fulfillment of God's covenant blessing to undo the curse for all mankind. And how does He do it? Seed of promise. He's sacrificial lamb. And because of this, man, we are now included. Like if you have put your faith and you have put your trust in Him and what He did on the cross, that man, you are now part of that family. And what is He doing? Dude, He's leading His people back into Eden. That's the end of the story. We don't see some ethereal, like cloudy, smoky place in the sky. That's not what heaven is, y'all. It's a city. It's here. It's a garden city, man. It's back in Eden. 
with fruit and the land just giving of itself. Like, read Revelation 21, 22. That's what it is. Dude, that's the place that He is leading His people. Covenant, land, and seed. And overall in the book of Genesis, we see that Jesus is the seed of promise who would come to undo the curse and lead His people back into Eden. That's the picture that Genesis is painting Jesus and of the Gospel. Y'all, here's the deal, man. We are faced with the same thing. We are faced with the same choice that, that Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Noah, Adam, and Eve. Just do you trust Him? Over and over again, we're faced with this choice, this question of like, do you trust me? Will you look back over the ways in which I've been faithful in the past and know that like I am the God who keeps my pr- Will you trust me in this? So I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're here for the very first time, like hearing this message, and you've never trusted him. You, you can do that. Man, you, you, you try to redefine good and evil for yourself all the time. What's the story of Genesis 1 through 3? Who does that? God does that. And when God does that, when God is the one who defines good and evil, man, the cosmos just work. Human relationships work. Work just works. Marriages work. Finances work. When we live under God's definition of what good and evil is, but when we go in and we redefine that and live in light of that, dude, that's when it shatters everything. And you have the choice. You can choose to like, dude, turn away from the ways in which you have defined good and evil for you and then look to God for His definitions of that and allow Him to be the one that defines that for you. And live in light of that, or, or like I said, you can just you can continue to do it, man. And, and look around the world. We have seven billion people that do that multiple times every day. We wonder why the world is the shape that it is. And, and maybe you're here and you've done that a long time ago. Maybe, maybe you followed after Jesus and you're like, yeah, that's good. Ah, that's a good gospel message. I like, get that out there. Whatever you know. Like, maybe, like no, 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 no. <laughs> Stop. So, man, our hearts are constantly trying to do this. We are all seeking a Savior. Most of the time it's just us, right? And how, do, how are we doing at that, man? I don't know. Nobody lets me down more than, than I do. It's just a shame that I can't be a pallbearer at my own funeral to let myself down like one last time, right? Like, nobody lets me down more than I do. No, nobody lies to me more than I do. Nobody like, dude, I'm a terrible Savior, right? Dude, don't, 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 look, at, don't look at me. Don't look at yourself that way. I, Dude, but we do. There's politics. Y'all, I've seen Christians and churches eat themselves alive like a snake eating its own tail over the last two years of these issues, man. Dude, we, we want this guy or that guy or this person or that. They're, they're the answer. They're the Savior, right? And if it's this guy, we're all doomed. And like, we're, no, we're not. We're not. But man, we start to we start to like put our trust in people. Whew. It's like maybe school reform, right? Dude, that's been another big one. I got, I got a wife that's a teacher, and so maybe like maybe I'm just more sensitive to this. But like the things that like teachers are doing, like like the parents and dude, I've watched people walk away in droves from that. And it's like, man, you you make the decision what's right for you and your family, and like that that's that's fine, right? Like like like. But I've watched people that actually what's been shown is that you've looked to that thing to be a sort of savior for you or your kids or something like that. And then when it when it fails you, like it, it inevitably will. All of a sudden now we're like upset about that. Like we're surprised by it. It's justice. Maybe it's just the big issues of like, I don't know, world hunger or whatever the case is. And you look around the world, it's just broke, man. Everybody's looking for a Savior. The question at the end of the day is like, do you, do you trust that seed of promise? And the hope and the life that He gives? It's the same exact thing that every person in history has had to come to. showed you last week, it's the same thing that Adam and Eve had to do. So I don't know, man, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, like just know that your heart gets drugged back over these issues all the time. You know what it is. It's the thing that like gets your blood pressure up a little bit, that you're ready to go to war over, or that you're ready to like fight with somebody that you love over. It's the thing that causes you to 
It's the thing that causes you to sin as you gossip or you slander somebody else or whatever the case is. And it's like, well, we're talking about so-and-so. And it's like, no, man, here's the deal. You don't get that option. And yet, because our hearts get drug away over these issues, we will do things and act like things and say things that like are completely inconsistent of what we know to be true of a follower of Jesus. And it's because we're looking to those things to be a Savior. And when they let us down, whew, See, there is a seed of hope, a seed of promise, and that's the story that Genesis is telling. You know what that thing is. You know what it is for you, and like, here's the deal. It's like, you can deal with that right now, follower of Jesus. You can deal with that right now if you've never heard like the story of Jesus in your life. You can walk out of here, man, and you can have dealt with that. Father, I, God, I've tried to define good and evil for myself. I've tried to run my own life. Father, I turn from that. Forgive me choose to fall after you (laughs) y'all it is that simple so i don't know where you're at i don't know where you came in here at but man i encourage you wherever you're at whatever that thing is like like don't allow this to be good information you know what i'm saying like don't 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 walk out of here and let this be like oh yeah it was great yeah it was good you know and like no no man you need to do something with that it's a choice you have to do something with it it's not do something with it is to still make a choice and to do something with it. So, I encourage you to do that. I'm going to be in the back after services if you'd like to talk. I'm going to be hanging out in the living room area. Hope you guys have a great week. And uh, man, please come back tonight at 5 o'clock for Adam's ordination. We'd love to have you all here for that. Let's pray as we close things out. Father God, we love you and we praise you. Father, we just thank you. Thank you for the picture of the gospel that we have and this beautiful story. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you loved us enough to walk towards us in the middle of our sin and not just to wipe us all out. Thank you for your promises. They're good, true, and trustworthy. Father, I just pray that you would show me personally the areas of my own heart that I have abandoned those, that I am trying to circumvent your good plan and your your good and evil definitions for the world around us father i just probably forgive me for that shine a light on those areas and on the on all of our hearts this week father as we come back and we realign re reorient our lives back to jesus i pray there's someone here that needs to do that for the very first time father that they would have courage to take that step and then to tell somebody about it father Father, we love you and we praise you. We ask that you would keep us and bring us back to your house and that we would worship you all week long.